I really appreciated Pastor Zeke's sermon on Sunday. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, he opened talking about a couple of competing definitions of happiness that we have. I really think that we spend both too much and too little time thinking about these things. Too much in the sense that uh, if, if you're like me, you spend a fair bit of time planning and scheming and trying, fi- trying to figure out what it's going to take to be happy in life. And uh, frankly, at, at any given moment, I'm aware of whether I'm happy or not. If you're to ask me at any random time if I'm happy, uh, I, I know the answer. Now, I may not tell you the answer. I might just say I'm fine. I might actually lie. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm not proud of why I'm not happy, or maybe it's because even though I know I'm not happy, I don't quite have the words to put to it. Uh, We spend plenty of time thinking about these things. But in another sense, we don't spend enough time thinking about it. And and by that, I mean that that, uh, we often don't consider what, what real biblical happiness is. And so we're stuck in a shallow sort of self defeating pursuit of happiness without ever, ever even really considering what, what it means to be happy in a, in a healthy and an appropriate way. Uh, it probably doesn't help that as a nation we are inundated with advertising and messages all reinforcing the, the same idea that we can only be happy if, uh, if we purchase the right product or take part in the right kind of service. Uh, only then can we be happy. We've, uh, we've bought into this materialist assumption that, that uh, we're material beings and our material souls can only be made whole by material stuff. Now, it'd be easy for me to rant about advertising or big business, but frankly, they've just figured out how to tap into something that's already there, something more fundamental that if, if we're going to attain true happiness, we need to genuinely deal with. It's that sense that uh, if I only had a little more money or the stuff that money can give me, then my soul will be at rest, then I'll be happy. If I can only fix this particular relationship problem, I'll be happy. If only this particular health issue was cleared up, then I can be happy. Uh, Wherever our wishes for the moment are taking us, if they could be fulfilled, we'd be happy. Uh, I've just seen uh, some of the new Jerry Seinfeld special, and at the opening of the special, he he teases his audience, telling them about the fact that uh, for for a few weeks, they've been looking forward to coming to see him, believing that it's going to give them enjoyment. And before he leaves the stage, he's promising them that their, their minds are already going to start to drift and Think about how much they just want to be home. It's this crazy hamster wheel that, that we ride on. We keep on seeking things that make us happy, and they keep eluding us. But Jesus gives us a different vision. He tells us that we can only reach what we're searching for when we stop actually pursuing it. This paradox is perhaps best summed up when Jesus said, Whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. Now, many of us have heard that verse before, and it's easy to agree intellectually. Uh, I've trusted in you, Jesus. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Of of course, I've lost my life for your sake. And yet, like water flows downhill, we catch ourselves obsessing about ourselves, our wants and our plans and our desires. What do I want right now? And undergirding all that is this unquestioned assumption that if I get what I want right now, I'll be happy. I'll be content. I'll have joy. And yet, if you're like me, you've experienced uh, at some point getting what you want and then discovering that it doesn't fulfill in the ways that that it had ever promised. A friend of mine has told me about how when he was in high school, he went to a school that was the Florida equivalent of Class A, and he he was on the football team there. And he and his teammates talked about and planned and worked and and dreamed about the day they would win a state title. And lo and behold, they won the state title. And he talks about the next morning waking up just thinking, I don't feel any different. Is this this all there is? Carol and I have have joked and talked about the same thing. Uh, Before we got married, we spent weeks planning and looking forward to the big event. And the big event comes and then you wake up the next day, and for a couple of weeks, you're looking at each other going, 
is, is this it? Is this what, what was promised? Uh, where, do we, where do we go from here? This isn't really what, what was advertised. Uh, and I bet you've got your own version of, of this kind of story. But Jesus wants to invite us out of that into something so much better. When the Pharisees asked Jesus to sum up the law, he quoted Deuteronomy. He said, love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. And now, this is known as the greatest commandment. And it, it is a command and in, in many ways a difficult one. But it's also a roadmap to the kind of fulfillment and the kind of joy that God wants us to have. Uh, we're designed to only find that fulfillment when we're looking outside of ourselves, when we're considering what God wants and who God is and what the needs of our neighbors are and what the needs of those around us are. When we genuinely forget about ourselves is when we find what we're actually made for, the, the kind of happiness that, that stuff, that material things, that the stuff of this world promises but can never ever deliver. Think with me for a minute. I bet you know someone who you could say, this person is a model of what Jesus was talking about. This person is excited to know God. This person loves other people. And when we know people like that, uh, it's easy to, hopefully in a good way, envy them to see that they have a, a lightness about their life, that they have a, a kind of, of joy and a kind of burdensomeness that, that we would, would like to have. That kind of life that I'm describing is available to all of us. This is something that's true all of the time, but I think it might be especially important for us to be talking about right now. Uh, because of the uncertainty we're dealing with and have been dealing with for so long, the strong temptation and many times the advice that we get is to turn inward, is to look after ourselves, is to think about our own wants and our own needs right now and how are we going to get through this. In, in some ways that is necessary, but in some ways that's a really strong temptation for us to, to simply descend into self-obsession. Uh, <laughs> but when we do that, we know what's on the backside of that self-obsession. And it's, it's a kind of emptiness and, and hopelessness that when, when we meet Christ, we know we must avoid. But turning inward like that is guaranteed to leave us empty. But it's so hard to step away from because to step away from it means admitting that we're not sufficient and admitting that we've been running on the wrong track all this time. And, and uh, apart from the grace of God, that's something that none of us wants to admit. Uh, but to admit it, to make that step, to say I cannot find fulfillment within myself is the first step toward finding the kind of contentment and joy that only God can give, the kind of contentment and joy that is described all throughout Scripture. When Paul wrote to the Romans, the church in Rome in the book of Romans, he told them to look outward in chapter 12, he says that normal life for a Christ follower is to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now that phrase rolls off the tongue, but it's not just poetic flourish. It really is Paul's and God's roadmap to discovering how to get over ourselves and find the kind of life and the kind of relationships that we're designed for. Now I know that doesn't always feel natural. Uh, is it easy to rejoice with those who rejoice? Uh, let's be honest, sometimes it's not. Sometimes when we've been staring at ourselves and considering that we're frankly disappointed with our circumstances, and then we see someone who seems to be doing better than us or having some kind of success, uh, in and of ourselves, envy can be the, the natural outcome. Now, it hurts to say that, but uh, saying that and telling ourselves the truth and really unpacking our thought process in that can be the road to repentance and going to God for healing and for the grace and ability to really enjoy the success of those around us and to celebrate with them. And to weep with those who weep is not an easy command. Uh, when we see others struggling, uh, the temptation is to think I have, I have nothing to offer them. They maybe don't even want me around. And yet to step into someone else's pain and struggle uh, really is, is a way to be an encouragement to someone, to discover all the things that we have to be thankful for, 
and really to emulate the life of Jesus in, in both of these ways. Uh, we see in the, in the life of Jesus his willingness to celebrate uh, a friend's wedding, his willingness to grieve with Mary and Martha the death of Lazarus. This is the life that Jesus lived and the kind of life that God is, is calling us into. Now, I know that in this season that we're in, it's tempting to say we don't uh, have the means to reach out to others. We don't have the ability to go to somebody's house. We have limits on where we can go. And maybe, maybe there's an exemption in Romans 12 for pandemics, but I, I checked and there's not. Uh, we are still called to live this way under all circumstances. And God will provide the means for us to do this. We may need to do it creatively these days, uh, electronically, whatever, but, but there's still a way to do this, to, in the uncertainty of these times, to step into the success of those around us and to celebrate with them. Uh, many around us are hurting in different ways, to step into their grief and just be with them. It can be helpful to really consider how we want to be treated. Uh, when Jesus says to love our neighbors as ourselves, in part, he's saying, consider your own wishes and know that that's, that's what other people long for as well. Uh, when I have success, I want to share it with somebody. I'm, I'm hopeful that somebody will celebrate with me. When I'm grieving, I just I want somebody by my side. I want to, to know that somebody's there. I don't need them to have answers, but I want company. I want somebody to share my grief with me. And these, uh, this way of living, this command, can really be a roadmap for us over the next few months and, and really for our for our entire lives as we seek the joy that God has for us and as we seek meaningful relationships. I can say that uh, I'm really thankful for this church and, and so many of you who have leaned in and uh, taken an interest in me and my family and, and uh, just been a true friend to me and to my family in our, our good days and in our bad days. And it's my prayer that as a church, we can be this for one another throughout this season, and that's become just a normal part of, of who we are. That's my prayer for us. I appreciate you listening. Thanks.